Thank you for joining our online service in Living Word IT Park. You may join us every Sunday for our English service. You may also give your love offering through online bank transfer or over-the-counter direct deposit. Bank details are shown on the screen. So once again, I would like to welcome everyone to our uh, 5.30 p.m. service. If it's your first time to join our service here in IT Park, I would like to welcome you. We're glad you're here. And if you want to know more about our church and how you can get involved, please do approach me after the service. Just a few announcements before we go to God's Word. Now, before the pandemic, we used to have a joint service for our Easter Sunday service, but we decided to resume with our Saturday service so that it won't be too crowded on Sunday morning. So on April 16, we will still have our regular Saturday service. And I just want to encourage uh, each one to invite a friend, a cousin, a relative to our uh, uh, Easter services. Uh, statistics show that more people are open to attend a Christmas service and, a, and an Easter service. And so if you know of anyone uh, who might be interested to attend uh, during our Easter ser service, please do invite them to church, okay? We will be having our first water baptism of the year. And the baptismal class will be on April 23. That's a Saturday, right after our Saturday service. Now, the, baptism, the baptismal class is a requirement uh, for those who will be going through water baptism. Uh, water baptism will be held on May 1, Sunday afternoon. And so, if you want to get water baptized, please do register. Please approach Sherwin after the service. Last week, Dr. Stephen started his preaching by saying that there are two basic types of people in the audience, those who are included and those who are excluded. Now, I would like to borrow his introduction and tweak it a little bit and say that there are two types of people in this room today, the spectators and the participants. The spectators are the ones who think that ministry is reserved for the extra spiritual Christian leaders who always seem to be in front of a crowd, preferably with a microphone. And so when they think about Christian ministry, they usually associate it with someone who preaches the Word of God or teaches the Word of God on a regular basis. In some ways, their idea of ministry is very narrow and unbiblical. The participants, however, believe that every follower of Christ is essentially called to the ministry. Why? Because ministry is simply what we do for God as a response to His saving grace. In other words, a believer who has truly experienced God's grace and God's mercy will ask, Lord, what can I do to serve you? That believer asks that question because he is overwhelmed and captivated by the love of Jesus Christ. He knows that serving the Lord in the ministry is one of the ways he or she can express his love for God and gratitude for what God has done to save him or her. They know that we are called to minister and call in all kinds of different ways. We don't have the same callings in the Christian life. Some are called to be pastors. Some are called to be missionaries. Some are called to serve the children in the Sunday school. Whatever your calling is as a believer, you know that it is one of the great privileges God has given a believer. 
It's humbling to know that God in His mercy and grace would save us. And I think it's more humbling to know that God wants to use us. Amen? He wants to use us for His glory. He wants us to proclaim the gospel, to advance the kingdom here on earth, and to glorify and magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we study our text today, we will see how the Apostle Paul joyfully fulfilled his calling as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so for those of you who are currently serving in a ministry, I pray that God would use Paul's example to motivate you, to encourage you, to continually be faithful to what God has entrusted to your care. And for those of you who are still trying to discern where God has called you, the particular ministry that God has prepared for you, I pray that Paul's life and ministry would challenge you to step out in faith and say, this year, Lord, use me. This year, Lord, I want to serve you. So let's read our text, and I would like to request each one to stand in honor of God's word. In Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 24, the Word of God says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of His body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the Word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to His saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, what a joy it is to know that we who were once alienated and separated from you have been reconciled through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And not only have you saved us by your grace, you have given all of us the opportunity and the privilege and the joy to serve you. Father, I pray that your church here in Living Word IT Park would truly function as the body of Christ. I pray that you would use this sermon, O God, to encourage us to fulfill our God-given callings in life so that as individuals and as a church, we can magnify Jesus as our Lord, Savior, and treasure. Be with us, Father, as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, before we dive into our text, we need to remember that Paul simply expands on his last statement. In chapter 1, verse 23, Paul says, of which I, Paul, have become a servant Now, having established that he is a servant or a minister of the gospel, he then goes on in verse 24 to define what that means. Now, as we study our passage tonight, we will see four requirements for having a fruitful ministry. As Christians, we don't just want to have a ministry. We want to have a ministry that is fruitful. We want to have a ministry that can truly glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you're currently serving in the ministry or you're still praying for a ministry where you can serve, I pray that you would always remember these four requirements for having a fruitful ministry. Now, the first reason why Paul had a very fruitful ministry is because he had the right attitude towards suffering. You find that in verse 24, the Apostle Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Now, these two words, sufferings and rejoice, they don't usually go together, right, in a sentence. It's like a contradiction in terms. 
So some people might wonder, how can Paul rejoice in his sufferings? Now, in today's world, we expect people to rejoice in their accomplishments, to rejoice in their wealth, to rejoice in their health. Consequently, Paul's rejoicing over his sufferings jolts a worldview that values comfort and ease as the highest good. Was Paul a sadistic person who loved to suffer, feel pain, and experience agony? No. He, like all of us, did not enjoy physical pain and emotional pain. So what is Paul trying to say here? Again, go back to the verse. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your what? For your sake. Your here refers to to the Colossian church. Now, when you understand the context and when you remember where Paul was when he wrote this epistle, it makes a lot of sense now why Paul is able to rejoice in his sufferings. Because as Paul wrote the letters to the Philippian church, the Ephesian church, the Colossian church, people who knew about his imprisonment were strengthened in their faith. They were encouraged by the faithfulness of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, in the midst of persecution, did not deny the Lord Jesus Christ. But he persevered and he endured. In fact, he tells the church in Philippi, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Paul understands that his gospel suffering served a great purpose. And that is to strengthen the believers, the Christian churches in the first century. And so as they remembered Paul's sufferings and the gospel that he proclaimed, it created this great impact in their communities, in their lives, and in their church. More people were able to know the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the Apostle Paul's faithfulness. And so Paul can rejoice because he looked at the benefits, the spiritual benefits it brought to others. As he suffered for their sake, they were given an example to follow. Now, we need to understand our faithfulness to Christ today in every situation not only affects us, but it affects our family members, It affects our church, can even affect our country, our city, or the world. If we respond to suffering the right way, if we are able to glorify God in the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering, those around us would be given courage to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think about our Ukrainian brethren in the midst of war, in the midst of that chaos that is happening in Ukraine right now, we still see them singing Christian songs. We still see them loving one another, serving the destitute. We do not know them personally. We have not met them, but their example of faithfulness in the midst of suffering has inspired all of us to continually serve the Lord Jesus Christ no matter what. And as we suffer for the sake of Christ, know this, you are assured that He will be with us in every trial and in every storm. The Apostle Paul knew that. He experienced that. That is why while he was under house arrest, while he was chained to a Roman soldier 24-7, he is still able to rejoice because he knows Jesus is with him. And I think that's one of the reasons why Paul was able to rejoice in his sufferings. Moving on, he says, And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Now, we have come to the most controversial passage in Colossians. This is one of the most challenging verses to interpret in this letter. So it's important that we understand it in its context because misinterpreting the difficult reference to filling up what is lacking in regard to Christ's affliction 
can lead to some major problems. Some might mistakenly infer that Paul suggests that Christ's redeeming work on the cross was not sufficient to save. That we need to add to what Jesus accomplished on the cross. This in no way refers to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Let us understand the death of Christ was once a once and for all finished and perfect work. Nothing can be added or taken away from the finished work of Jesus. So what did Paul mean when he said, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction? First, you need to understand Paul is not referring to Christ's redeeming work in this passage. Every time Paul refers to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus or his redemptive work on the cross, he uses the words blood, cross, or death, not afflictions. And remember, as we've been studying the book of Colossians, this book speaks about the sufficiency and the supremacy of Jesus Christ over all things. The Gnostics were saying that it's not enough to to trust in Jesus. You need to have this, this superior knowledge. You need to unlock this mystery that will bring you salvation. No, Paul is saying Jesus Christ is more than enough. He is sufficient to save us. He has redeemed us. He has granted us eternal life. He has reconciled all things to Himself. And we know Jesus made that clear before his death. He cried out, it is, it is finished. Second, the thought is that the union between Christ and his people is so intimate. Remember Paul said Jesus is the head of the body. The body of Christ is the church. The union between Christ and his people is so intimate that he suffers when they suffer. I think we get an indication of Paul's meaning from Acts 9. Remember that time when Paul was on his way to persecute and imprison more Christians? On the Damascus Road, the risen Lord appeared to, at that time he was addressed as Saul. And what did Jesus say? Do you guys remember? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, before he encountered the Lord Jesus Christ, we know Jesus ascended into heaven, sat at the right hand of the Father. So perhaps Paul would say, well, I wasn't persecuting you. I was persecuting your followers. But the reason why Jesus is able to say that is because he has this intimate union with his body, the church. So when you touch the church, when you persecute Christians, you are, in a sense, persecuting the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. As Christians, we have been buried with Christ. Remember that? We are raised together with Him and made alive together with Him. And so if we share in His dying and rising, we also share in His sufferings and He with ours. So when we suffer hunger, for the sake of Christ, or imprisonment, or persecution for the sake of Christ, He is there. And not only is He aware about our pain, He shares our pain. Jesus is our sympathetic high priest. So when we suffer hunger, or beating, or imprisonment, or humiliation, isn't it comforting to know that our Savior suffers with us. He's for you. He is with you. You know, this, this idea is, I think, best illustrated in the life of the late Dr. Helen Rosevere. She was a British missionary who served for over 20 years in the jungles of Congo, that's in Africa, and she had a significant ministry. She was the only doctor in an area populated by more than half a million people. 
Now, in 1964, there was a revolution that took place in Congo, and her workers were captured and subjected to brutal and degrading torture for almost six months. And she was personally and violently attacked as well. She watched a 17-year-old student who was beaten and left for dead when he tried to defend her. It all put her in a state of despair. She did not doubt the existence of God, but she kind of wondered if God had abandoned her during that moment. It was at that time, while she was back in England, recovering from all of this, that these words came to her, not audibly, but convincingly. Twenty years ago, you asked me for the privilege of being a missionary, the privilege of being identified with me, these are not your sufferings. These are my sufferings. When God impressed that upon her heart, she was liberated. She was overwhelmed by the love and mercy of God, and that allowed her to recover not only physically, but also emotionally. Her recovery was not easy, of course, but she was able to rejoice and say that the Lord is able to use even the trials in life in order for us to know His comfort, to know His love, and to know His mercy and grace better. For those of you who were in the valleys, for those of you who experienced trial and pain, and in those moments, you continually trusted the Lord and depended on Him. You know for a fact that that was one of the sweetest moments you had with Jesus. I love what Kevin DeYoung said. He said, the sovereignty of God is our fuel for ministry faithfulness. When we know that everything happens for a purpose, nothing happens by chance or by accident, but God allows the good and the bad to take place in our lives in order for us to know Him better and glorify Him more as we respond in a biblical way. So guys, nothing, even your sufferings, are wasted. Amen? Paul understood that. That's why he could say, I rejoice in my sufferings. And so if you want to have a fruitful ministry, remember this. You need to have the right attitude towards suffering. Secondly, you need to have the right attitude towards service. Take a look at verse 25. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you and to make the word of God fully known. Now, the Greek word for servant in verse 25 is the word diakonos, which simply means servant. Somebody who serves. It is a picture of someone getting down in the dirt to serve others. That describes the life of the Apostle Paul. He was selfless. He was sacrificial. He always thought about the glory of God and the good of others, even in his sufferings. And I think we have to keep that perspective as we serve the Lord in the ministry. People, or Paul, had been commissioned by God to be a servant of the church. Not a superstar. Not a celebrity apostle. And I always have a problem when people say, oh yeah, pastor so-and-so is a celebrity pastor. I think that is a contradiction in terms. Because a pastor is not called to be a celebrity. A pastor is called to be a servant. A servant of God and a servant of the people of God. There's no real service, Christ-like service, unless it is humble, selfless, sacrificial service. And the reason why Paul was such a humble servant was because he understood the only reason he was given the privilege of being a servant of God was because of God's initiative in calling him into the ministry. Notice, it says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me 
for you. What made the Apostle Paul a minister? It wasn't his education. It wasn't his ethnicity. It was not because he was a, the, the prized student of the great Gamaliel. He was made a servant of God. Why? Because God chose him for this special task. To be an apostle of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. One of the most clear texts of Paul's letters relating to this is found in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, where he says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me in that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now, Paul never forget his past. He knew he was responsible for the death of Stephen. He persecuted and imprisoned many Christians. He was the enemy of the church at some point. But boy, was Paul humbled by the fact that not only God saved him, but gave him the privilege to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know what? That, that, should, that should resonate with us. Because at one point, we too were God's enemies, right? We too were once rebels. We too were haters of God, indulging in sin. And yet God not only saved you, but has called you to be a servant. And when you remember that, you will not see ministry as a burden to endure, but as a privilege to enjoy. God called him for this. Third, a fruitful ministry requires an area of ministry. Paul says, the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Paul was called to be a preacher or teacher of the word of God. God did not call him as an apostle to share his own ideas or opinions about any subject. He was called by God to make the word of God fully known. Verse 26 says, The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Paul narrows his preaching of the counsel of God to one specific area, and he calls it mystery here. Now, when you hear the word mystery, mystery to us means something hidden, you know, mysterious thoughts withheld from the masses and revealed only to an elite few. By the way, this is how the heretical Gnostics use this term at Colossae, indicating that the true religion was found in their particular brand of knowledge, their secret codes and passwords. And so when they would go to the church and interact with these Christians, they would say, it's good that you, you believe that Jesus is a redeemer, but do you really want to know the truth? Let's have lunch together, and let me tell you about this mystery that you need to know. And, and this mystery, by the way, is reserved for a few elite spiritual people, and that could be you. No. No. Paul is saying that mystery has now been revealed. You don't need these Gnostics to show you what this mystery is all about. In the New Testament, the word mystery means the revealing of something hidden in the past, but is now fully revealed. This mystery Paul is referring to is something that was hidden from the Jews in the Old Testament. This hidden secret is now open to those who are in Christ. Now, listen carefully. The mystery is not that Gentiles, the Gentiles who lived before Christ, couldn't be saved. They could. Remember Ruth? Ruth was a Moabite. Ruth was a Gentile, but she got saved. Remember Rahab, the prostitute? She too was a Gentile, but she too got saved. However, Gentiles who believed and accepted Judaism were proselyte Jews. And unfortunately, they were considered by the Jews as lower than the Jews, lower than them. They were like second-class believers. Now, the mystery here is that in Christ, Jews 
and Gentiles are on an equal spiritual plane in Christ. Paul develops this idea in his letter to the church in Ephesus. Chapter 3, verse 6, the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles, and by the way, we're Gentiles, okay? If, I don't think there's anyone here who is a Jew. So if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, okay? Through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So Christ among the Gentiles is not plan B. It has always been God's plan to make these two groups of people one. That is why all of us who are in Christ, we are one in Jesus. It does not matter what the color of your skin is, what your educational background is, what your status in life is, white or black, rich or poor. If you are in Christ, you are part of God's family, and you share, together with all the believers in Christ, the same spiritual blessings. Now, try to put yourself in the shoes of these Colossian believers. They probably heard about the Old Testament and how believers were treated during that dispensation, and how they realize, wow, so you mean to say me being a male Gentile Christian, I don't have to be circumcised. We don't have to follow the Jewish dietary laws in order to be accepted by God. Are you saying that we have this equal standing with our fellow Jewish brethren? That was mind-blowing. And that amazed them, and that should continually amaze us. Moreover, Paul does not want them to miss the key element of the mystery that is stressed in verse 27. The riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There are riches yet to be known. There are riches yet to be experienced. And we know hope is future. And when we talk about Christian hope, we're talking about absolute certainty about the fulfillment of God's promises. And we know when Jesus Christ returns, He will make all things new. He will reconcile all things to Himself. And we believers will experience our best life. By the way, this is not your best life, okay? You know, Joel Austin wrote a a, a popular book. He's a prosperity gospel preacher. He entitled the book, Your Best Life Now. If you tell me this is my best life now, I need to wear a mask everywhere I go. And other, these, there are these wars taking place all around the world. That's so discouraging, right? Your best life is future. And that future is certain. Amen you will one day experience this blessed hope when Jesus Christ returns. Are you excited for the return of Jesus? I hope we are. I hope we are. Because it will be a glorious day when He returns. And because of this hope that we have, Paul calls it the hope of glory. That is beyond our comprehension. He speaks of this in 2 Corinthians 4.17. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Now, when you're going through a trial, a difficult trial, I mean, all trials are difficult, but there are, more, there are some trials that are just too heavy to bear, right? It doesn't seem momentary. It seems like it's forever. When will my pain end, Lord? When will this trial end, Paul says light affliction. When a doctor tells you you have cancer, when someone that you love is dying, the affliction doesn't seem light. Now, Paul is not trying to minimize our suffering and take them lightly, but here's what Paul is trying to say and hear him out. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. In other words, in light of what's to come, 
In light of what we will experience when Jesus Christ returns, when He appears in all of His glory, when that time comes, we would be able to conclude, oh yes, that was momentary and light affliction. You know why Paul wants them to understand this? It's because he knows that when believers have this greater grasp of God's saving work, Christ will enable his readers to protect themselves from false teachings. Do you know that Christians are vulnerable to false teachings when they are not convinced that God, Jesus Christ, is their hope? When they are not satisfied in the Lord, they're vulnerable to attacks when Jesus is not the center of their lives and the center of their affections. But if they are firmly rooted in understanding the rich mystery of their faith, they will not be deceived or deluded by arguments no matter how persuasive. So Paul knew he was called to proclaim the, the, this mystery to the Gentiles. He had an area of ministry, and that's a, the thing that you need to consider. If you want to have a fruitful ministry, you need to have an area of ministry. Now, we will never be like Paul in the sense, like, you know, be an apostle of Jesus Christ. That was reserved for only a select few. But all of us who are in Christ have been given this privilege to proclaim the same gospel the apostle Paul proclaimed. Now, we can do that in different ministries, in different settings. Some of you may be called by God to proclaim the gospel in the children's ministry. And that's a very important ministry. We want God to raise a generation here in Living Word IT Park who will remain faithful to the gospel and to the Lord Jesus Christ. If God is calling you to serve in the couples ministry, and by the way, last Tuesday we had three new couples attend our couples ministry. Praise God for that. As I've been announcing the, the, the schedules of these ministries, it's, it's encouraging to know that we're seeing new people, new couples, new members getting involved in the work here in IT Park. You see, it's not just enough for us to congregate here every Saturday or Sunday. If we want to grow, if we want God to develop our spiritual muscles, we need to exercise faith and say, Lord, here I am. I am available. I, we need to have that sense of urgency because we only have one life to live. I don't know about you, but I don't want this short life of mine to be about comfort, ease, and, and you know, pursuing the things that the unbelievers are pursuing. I, want, I hope we want this short life of ours to be all about magnifying and glorifying the God who loved us and gave himself up for us. This is our only shot. This is our only chance to live for Christ. There's no such thing as a reincarnation. When we die, that's it. So I hope we, 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 we maximize whatever opportunity God has given to us. God has blessed every believer with at least one spiritual gift. So if you have the gift of teaching, teach. If you have the gift of helps, serve. If you have the gift of mercy, Minister to the poor and the destitute. If you have the gift of leadership and administration, lead. Think about this. What if every attendee or every member here in our church fulfilled this role? I tell you, we will outgrow this place in a month's time. When we're helping one another, when we're serving together, more things can be done and accomplished for the glory of God. Are you excited to serve the Lord? I hope we are. Do you have an area of ministry? Do you know where God has called you to serve? Now, before you look for opportunities, the first thing you should do is to consecrate your whole life to God. Because when you are completely consecrated to God, and He begins to open doors for you, you're there and ready to serve. Amen. Lastly, to be fruitful for the Lord, you need to have an aim for ministry. Can you say aim? Verse 28, Him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we 
may present everyone mature in Christ. You know, the reason why Paul was so focused and determined to fulfill his calling as an apostle is because he knew the goal. He knew the aim. He knew why he was called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. He says, we proclaim Christ. Him, we proclaim. The apostle Paul did not proclaim law. He did not proclaim prosperity, some system or some method. He proclaimed Christ. And you need to get this, church. A Christless Christianity is no Christianity at all. What makes Christianity unique from all the other religions is that we believe God became man and this God-man, Jesus Christ, lived a perfect life for you and, and for me. He died an obedient death on the cross. He rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father and has promised that he will return for his bride, the church. And we who have been saved have been saved by his grace, not through our effort, not because of anything that we have done. We are saved by his grace. If we don't proclaim Christ, we will end up proclaiming something else. If Christ is not the center of the message, if the cross is not the center of it all, if the gospel of a crucified, risen Savior whose work of atonement saves the sinner through faith and grace, if that is not preached, then there is no ministry to talk about. A Christianity without Christ at the center is no Christianity at all. And then he says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So there are two ways to do this. Yes, we want to proclaim Christ, but how do we do it? First, we warn. This is the negative aspect of the message. We need to warn people that if they don't embrace Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they will face terrible consequences. Paul was not a seeker-sensitive preacher. He did not preach Christ in order to tickle the ears of people, giving them, them, giving them what they want to hear. As he proclaimed Christ, he warned people. That's why the gospel is offensive. You mean to say there's nothing else that I could do in order to make myself pure and righteous before the sight of God? You mean to say I'm a sinner deserving of wrath and judgment? When we proclaim the gospel, before we present the good news, we must first make sure we're presenting the bad news because people will not appreciate the good news of what Jesus accomplished on the cross if they don't know the bad news. If they don't know they are hopeless and helpless without a Savior. So we need to warn people. Second, we need to teach, and this is the positive aspect of proclaiming Christ. Our aim involves teaching everyone God's Word, meaning we need to disciple and develop the saved. The gospel can be understood in very simple terms, but it is a very profound message. That's why somebody once said the gospel, you know, you can summarize it in a piece of paper, but if you study the depths of it, it can fill an entire library. That's how glorious the gospel message is. And if you want to have a deeper understanding of the gospel, you need to study the scriptures. You need to be part of a small group where you can ask questions, where you can have someone disciple you and teach you more about what Christ has done to reconcile humanity back to God. Being involved in a Bible study group is essential to your spiritual development. A sheep is most vulnerable when it is separated from the flock. Why? Because he is, that sheep is exposed to the dangers of you know, wild beasts and extreme weather conditions. Sadly, many Christians today, especially during the pandemic, say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I don't need the church. 
Remember, Satan is described as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So when you isolate yourselves from the community of faith, you're vulnerable to all kinds of attacks. In order for you to continually hear the message of God, you need to surround yourself with believers who love the Lord and love His Word and are committed to applying it in their lives. So if you want to join a small group, please do approach me after the service. So why do we do this? Why do we want to be committed to these things? The one aim or goal of warning and teaching is that everyone may be presented what? Can you say it for me? Mature in Christ. A believer can be part of a church for 40 years and still be immature. And let me just say how important spiritual maturity is. A lot of us love to have harmonious relationships, right? We want to be able to make good, wise, sound decisions in life. When you think about those conflicts that you had with church members or family members, when you look back at those moments, you will realize that it was a maturity issue. When you made bad decisions in life, you can look back, oh, I, I, I made that decision because I lacked spiritual maturity. And here's my point. A lot of people say, you know, studying the Bible is a waste of time. I'd rather be pragmatic in solving things. But do you know that studying the Bible, learning God's Word, it's not only the most spiritual thing, one of the most spiritual things you can do, it is one of the most practical things you can do as a Christian. Why? Because when you know what the Word of God says, you grow in the fear of the what? Fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of wisdom. And so this must be our aim this year in every single year of our lives. Lord, as I gather with your people, as we study the word of God together, as I spend time alone with you meditating on your word, my goal is to mature as a believer. Because when you are spiritually mature, you would respond to certain people the right way. You will respond to certain situations the right way. You will end up making good, sound decisions along the way for the glory of God. Imagine a church that is filled with spiritually mature believers. That can be our church, I.T. Park. And I hope that is the aim that you have as a believer. Now we know maturing as a believer is hard work. It's not an easy goal. And if you're called to serve in a ministry and you're dealing with people and they have different personalities, they have different issues, ministry can be messy. Ministry can be painful. Ministry can be hard. Paul says in verse 29, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. Two strong impressions arise from this verse. The first is Paul's intensity reflected in the words toil and struggling. The first indicates severe labor. The latter is an intensive form of the Greek term from which where we get the word agony. So if you think ministry is a walk in a park, if you think it's a, you know, a bed of roses, you're greatly mistaken. It's, it's going to be difficult. At times, it's going to be lonely and painful. But beyond this depiction of extreme effort, here's the good news. There is grace. God's power was at work within Paul. And the good news for those of us who are serving in the ministry and for those of us who will be serving in the ministry is that God will be with us every step of the way. Amen? It's His working, working in you mightily. And the reason why Paul had a fruitful ministry is because he worked hard and he prayed hard. Grace, by the way, does not oppose effort. In fact, it is the grace of God that influences our effort. Divine empowering made possible, made Paul's ministry fruitful. Work and grace go hand in hand. The gifted uh, preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon understood this truth. 
Uh, if you know church history, you know that he's one of the gifted preachers. In fact, he's described as the prince of preachers. But only a few people know that this man was not only an eloquent preacher, but he was a very dependent man. He was dependent on God. In fact, as he would mount the stairs on his way to the pulpit, he would repeat these words before he would preach. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Why did he have that such dependence? He wrote, the gospel, listen carefully, the gospel is preached in the ears of all. It only comes with power to some. The power that is in the gospel does not lie in the eloquence of the preacher. Otherwise, men would be converted of souls. Nor does it lie in the preacher's learning. Otherwise, it would consist in the wisdom of men. We might preach until our tongues rotted, until we exhausted our lungs and died, and never a soul would be converted unless there was a mysterious power going with it, the Holy Spirit changing the will of man. Oh, sirs, he said, we might as well preach to stone walls as preach to humanity unless the Holy Spirit be with the word to give it power to convert the soul. I understand as a pastor here, if the Holy Spirit does not empower what we do here on a weekly basis, nothing will be accomplished. And so as a church, yes, let us work hard, let us labor for the gospel, but let us never forget the divine enablement that can only come from the Holy Spirit. And you need that as you face challenges in the ministry. There might be times you would be tempted to quit or give up. But when you remember the Holy Spirit is the source of energy and power, you will remain committed no matter what. Ultimately, ministry is not our work. It is the work of God. And so if God has called you into a particular ministry, be comforted by this truth that he who calls is also the one who empowers. Amen. What a great God we serve. So are you ready to serve? <laughs> are you excited to serve? My prayer is that we all will not only be excited, but all of us would be dependent on our gracious Lord to do the work through us. Today, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. It is an exclusive celebration for those who have believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It is not a means to salvation, but it is a testament of a believer's faith in the atoning work of Christ on the cross. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, let us read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to Let us take this time to confess our sins to the Lord. Let us now thank God for the salvation and forgiveness we have received from God through our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ.
and may now partake of the bread and the wine. 